Good afternoon. You are in the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we've been spending some time in the last uh, week or two on H196. Um, and we took a look at the language in this uh, fairly straightforward bill uh, yesterday. And um, uh, so I'm glad to have Bryn here with us. And Bryn, if you want to just um, just to make it official, tell us what this uh, bill language accomplishes, and we'll take some questions from there. Sure thing. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Uh, I just sent Andrea an, an updated, edited draft of um, the amendment to 196, so I'm hoping she posted that. And if you'd like, I can share my screen so you can look at that version. We all have secondary devices, so Great. we can follow along. Great. So Andrea, did you have a chance to post that draft 1.2? I have not, but I emailed it to the committee. So I'm going to go post it now. Thank you. Okay, so you should have, um, you should be looking at draft 1.2 um, from today. <clears throat> and I don't know if you looked at the at draft 1.1 or not, if the committee has looked at that. Have you looked at 1.1 yet? We did. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So this just adds a little phrase. I'll, sh I'll show you the difference. Um, but this is really pretty straightforward language. It's session law adding um, two new positions to the agency of administration. Um, so it provides that those positions are permanent and classified and authorized in fiscal year 2022, a policy research analyst and an outreach and education coordinator. And it specifies that the positions are transferred and converted from existing vacant uh, positions in the executive branch. And then here's where the addition is, is on line 15 to support the work of the executive director of racial equity, just to make it perfectly clear what these positions are for. Um, and then subdivision C sets out the appropriation, which is $250,000 to fund those positions coming from the general fund. And then on the second page is the effective date, which is on passage. And that's that. Sweet and simple. Uh, questions for Bryn on the words on the page. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for uh, getting to the meeting late. I was uh, encumbered by some mouthy guy who talked a lot. Um, Bryn, uh, uh, a lot of the conversation that people have been having with me is uh, the, the independence of this whole office and structure. And having worked in city government for a long time, I know it's not very plausible uh, to have a standalone like a labor board or something like that in this context. Is, is there in any way something that that makes it more independent under the secretary of the agency than one normally would have. And I know oh. that that's a really poorly framed question, but it seems to go to the issue that I've been hearing a lot from people about. So are you talking about the position of the executive director? I assume you're talking about that um, position. I am, I am, but in the context of adding to, I mean, as things grow, people look, more and more for supervisory structure. I don't know if it's not germane, having just had plenty of germane conversations. Um, but if you have an opinion at some point in time, I wouldn't mind hearing it, maybe not in the middle of this particular. Okay, I'll take my direction from the chair, if you'd like me to respond or not. So we have come back to this question a number of times about whether, whether the, um, racial equity director would be um, preferable in a standalone independent situation versus uh, embedded within an administrative agency. And um, I would prefer not to, to take up that question in the context of this bill. Uh, this bill is putting um, statutory language around an appropriation that was called for in the governor's, governor's recommended budget. Um, if we wanted to get into the larger question of an independent racial equity director in Vermont, um, we would want to do a full analysis of all of the perspectives on, on the benefits or 
uh, drawbacks of having uh, an independent commission versus one embedded in, in uh, the governor's administration. And uh, frankly, I, I don't think we wanna slow down the appointment of these positions uh, in, to allow for time to talk about independence. And I, I appreciate that, Madam Chair. I know that she has had conversations about it and it's, it just seems like all of a sudden there's a, a much bigger uh, deluge of information coming in from the public about that to my mailbox anyway. So I uh, will withdraw the question and thank you very much for your tolerance. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, yeah. I. I I definitely agree with the chair about this issue. I mean, if you look at the statute and the duties of the executive director of, of racial equity, um, almost all of those duties rely around coordinating um, with various agencies within state government. I think we would have to rewrite the entire statute if we were to make this an independent person, an independent agency in the state. So, I mean, that, that would be, a lot of work and I would want to have testimony as to why the current operation is not working um, before we moved in that direction. Thanks. And Rob, you had your hand up. Or... Sorry, Madam Chair, that was by mistake. I was hitting something else on my iPad. I apologize. <laughs> well, I know you won't be shy. If you want to have a chance to ask a question, you just jump right in there again. <laughs> Um, okay, so other questions for Bryn on the words on the page. And I think by, um, by moving this bill forward does not foreclose a conversation in the future about whether there is an advantage to an independent um, entity, but, um, but in keeping with the timeline of approving the governor's recommended additional positions, um, I'd like to try to move this today. Uh, Sam Lefebvre has a hand up. Sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I know that we had asked um, previous people that had testified where these positions were coming from. And I feel like maybe that uh, was a little bit of a squished answer. So can we get clarification again that I understand that we keep saying that they are coming from holes in the executive, but where are they coming from a fresh pool? Are they coming from the internal pool or from the outside? Bryn, can you help orient us to how this all works perhaps? Oh, so I don't know exactly where they're coming from. This is the, um, this is the language that I received from um, the executive branch. I didn't receive any specific information about what positions, um, where the positions are coming from. But I will say that when you set up new positions, you do it one of two ways. You create new ones or you transfer um, existing positions that are not filled. Um, so I apologize that I don't have any more interesting information for you. Madam Chair, if I may, I, I just feel that we have asked um, some questions of others that have testified, and I understand the importance of uh, making sure that this is out in, in the timely manner, um, but I just feel that maybe there's some more, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I do feel that some of the committee questions have been asked and that some of the questions weren't directly answered, and it might be the same situation where they just weren't, um, didn't have the information. Um, I understand that uh, Ms. Hare is specific to the language she is presenting to us, um, but I'm just not sure that all of our questions have been answered. So Bryn, can you um, enlighten us uh, who you were communicating with in the administration to, uh, to build this language that uh, is fleshing out the request that they made? Um, sure, so I primarily communicated with the member of your committee, Representative Colston. Um, who I believe was in touch with um, members of the executive branch that were um, responsible for putting forward this suggestion. Um, and um, there was something else I wanted to say, but I forgot. Hopefully it'll come back to me in a minute. Thanks. Rob? 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm thinking back on this, and I believe that either I was involved in or part of a discussion where these two positions, um, even though they're new positions, they're coming out of the current position pool. So we're not necessarily increasing the size of the number of state employees by positions, but because they're coming out of vacant positions that are already there, if that helps, Sam. I think um, it would be helpful in the larger sense for us to have a little um, uh, state government positions 101 seminar for the benefit of all of us who've learned it and forgotten it, but also for members of the committee uh, who are new. Um, but if this is language that has been recommended by the administration, I'm going to take their word for it that this is, uh, this is how they would like to accomplish adding these positions to the racial equity director's office. I remember the other thing I was going to say, which is that because the bill contains an appropriation, I imagine that it will next go to the appropriations committee, which will receive, and they tend to receive the finer, more granular details about where the positions are coming from in my experience. Yes. All right, Hal, if you are um, ready, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Any other committee discussion about H196 draft 1.2? which is posted on the committee page. All right. When you're ready, Hal. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. McClare. Yes. Cooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Jehovski. Yes. The fave. <clears throat> yes. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote tally is 11 0 0. Thank you, committee. So we have um, one other item on our agenda this afternoon, and that is to come back to Tucker Anderson um, with respect to the charter amendments, um, specifically the aspects of the Montpelier Charter on all resident voting that differ from the Winooski Charter. So uh, Tucker, I know you all were in the middle of a conversation this morning. So if I haven't characterized where you left off or what you were expecting to answer, you just go right ahead and answer the question that you were left with before lunchtime. Because I explained to the committee before that I listened to the morning committee work on my lunch break, but I couldn't quite get through the entire hour. I didn't carry your attention the whole time. <laughs> Shocking. I was listening to uh, you at two times speed, but I couldn't get through the whole hour in the 30 minutes that I had for it, lunch. Did it change the tone of my voice at all when uh, No, it doesn't. It's quickly? quite wonderful. Yeah. All it does is eliminate any pauses that we might put in between words. <laughs> um, where the committee left off was that uh, the vice chair and the committee members had requested that I send along uh, the ledge council memos concerning the constitutionality of uh, non-citizen voting. Um, I sent the most recent version, which was from May, 2019. It's a 16 to 18 page memo, including appendices. Um, and it covers the constitutional authority for the General Assembly to uh, determine the qualifications for uh, local elections and local voters. In addition, I sent along some materials that uh, Betsy, myself, and Michael Chernick dug up of historical references to statutes that allowed uh, greater pools of voters than were contemplated by the Vermont Constitution. So there's a little bit of history there that you can go through. 
um, and additionally, a memo that was prepared for Senate government operations on this charter amendment by uh, Peter Teachout. So those were the primary uh, research materials that were used to discuss the constitutionality of non-citizen or all resident voting. Thank you, Tucker. Who's got questions? Peter Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not so much a question, but it seemed to me that the Montpelier version uh, is uh, in at least one respect less controversial because of the um, specificity of the idea of resident. Um, and obviously uh, the Winooski's got a bunch of other issues as we spoke over the prior to the lunch hour that will take a lot more time to parse out. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the way the Montpelier one is right now, frankly, but uh, I, you know, don't want to be overbearing about it. <laughs> Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my, my sense of it is, is that we're, we're quickly coming to a point where we're going to vote on this, which I totally support in that. I remember being part of this conversation last year, quite honestly, as well. And I don't think that there's any question about the constitutionality of it is it is constitutional. Um, I think that there's also some history there that shows that it, it was allowed to happen in the past as well. However, for me, I, I struggle with this one some in that um, while one, for me, it's kind of a two part process in that if we do have people who have applied to become citizens and because of the process they are denied the ability to vote um i do struggle with that i think that if if they've gone through the process and because of no fault of their own they're not able to they should be allowed to but the other part of this for me is that there are people and if i recall correctly one of the witnesses from montpelier was a woman who has been living in montpelier for many many years and she was currently a citizen of another country. And if I remember correctly, it was a country that did not allow dual citizenship. So therefore she couldn't be, become a US citizen and not give up her citizenship from her the former, or well, the country she was from. To me, that's different in that she's making a conscious choice whether she gives up her citizenship or not. We couldn't go vote in her country. We do in the US allow dual citizenship. So for me, it's life's about choices. So unless somebody can assure me that this Montpelier charter change is addressing those issues, um, I will be voting no on it somewhat reluctantly because there is a part of this that really does resonate with me as far as people shouldn't be penalized if they're in the process. But if it's gonna allow folks that have made a conscious choice not to become citizens, then that's their choice. And the other part, I guess, while I'm thinking here is, you know, we're talking about people looking on voting on vote, um, voting on local issues, for instance, like Montpelier, if I recall correctly, Montpelier is a unified school district. They are Montpelier and Roxbury. So if these folks were given the opportunity to vote, they could not vote on school budgets because it's a unified school district. So I just see this process fraught with all sorts of logistical issues. And there is some budgetary concerns as well because we do have a statewide education funding formula that these things all play into. So I will be voting no, but for those reasons, not because I don't 
conceptually agree with them if they're legally going through the process and just haven't been able to get through it yet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 17 years in some Scandinavian country, as I recall, but uh, I, I have a question, I guess, for Tucker. I, I am under the impression that we do not allow dual citizenship and that our oath of citizenship has something in it that basically says renouncing all others. Um, I, you know, would, I guess, fall to Rob's point at some degree, but frankly, we're the country that landed the free home of the brave and everybody's welcome. I don't think at this level that granting the right to vote, no matter what the reason, if you're paying taxes, you're living in a community, I support this fully and uh, I'm proud to stand behind it. Thanks. John yeah. Gannon. Board. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind people that non, and John Odom sort of testified about this, that non, non-citizen voting has actually been the norm for much of the United States' history. Um, Non-citizens voted in every presidential election until 1924. Um, so, I, I mean, this is not something that's new to this, the, this country, and it's not new to Vermont. Vermont allowed non-citizens to vote before it even became part of the United States. Um, so this is part of our history. Um, unfortunately, because of nativism and racism, we changed those policies. And I don't think we should continue with those types of policies um, that are racist and nativist in nature. Thanks. Mark Higley. Yeah, I object to John's uh... Uh, clarification that for some reason, if I or anybody votes against this, we're somehow racist. Uh, I'm getting tired of that mantra, regardless of, of what your position might be. And I will not state all my reasons for not voting for this, but I will not be voting for this. Thank you. Other committee discussion? John. Um, I just want to apologize to any member of the committee. I was not saying they were racist or, or nativist. I'm just saying the change in, in policy in Vermont and the United States was driven by racism and nativism when those changes were made. So I apologize to any member of the committee um, that thought I was intending to um, consider them a racist or a nativist. Apology accepted. Thank you, John, for um, drawing that distinction. That was my understanding of what you said as well. Um, and I think it's uh, good of you to point it out. Mike Merwicki. Just to clarify, uh, one of the highlights here, we are looking to approve people to vote only in municipal elections, right? Nothing beyond that. Yes, uh, Representative Merwicki, that is correct. It is strictly uh, city elections and the charter amendment calls out that um, non-citizen voters are prohibited from voting in federal, state, county, special district or school district offices or questions. So they're not allowed for uh, to vote, for example, in the unified uh, school district votes and they're not allowed to vote for water and sewer district votes, things like that. This would strictly be city elections and questions. Thank you. Mike McCarthy. Something I just wanted to point out was that unless things are very different uh, there than they are in, in my municipality, the school district and other district ballots happen on a completely separate ballot. So the I think there was a little bit of an implication in an earlier comment about there being you know, budgetary logistical issues, the elections. And I think we heard pretty loudly from uh, the clerk that, you know, they had thought through uh, the 
ramifications and that they were pretty minimal in terms of having the two separate checklists and being able to accommodate the uh, non-citizen voting. So I'm definitely gonna be voting yes here. All right, any other committee discussion on the Montpelier Charter? Sam LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so I guess I'd like further clarification while they may not um, be voting in the, uni you know, the unified school districts, um, some of the questions within the city may be opting into money's questions, correct? Yes, if it is an issue on the city ballot, which would include budgetary items at the city's annual meeting, then non-citizens would be able to vote on them. Al Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will be supporting um, this uh, bill. And I was struck earlier by a comment made by Representative Mary Hooper and, and her reason for supporting this is because it builds community. And that's a good thing for our democracy. Thank you. All right, any other committee discussion or questions for Tucker on H-177 Montpelier Charter Amendments? All right, I would entertain a motion. <laughs> so moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. Hal, when you're ready. And we need you to unmute. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon? Yes. Ricky? Yes. LeClaire? No. Hooper? Yes. Colston? Yes. Anthony? Yes. Mihovsky? Yes. The Fave? No. Higley? No. McCarthy? Yes. Copeland Hans. Yes. The vote is eight, three, zero. Thank you all.